de nuevo Nicolás Pepe, la pone Pepe, va buena, segundo palo, quien la gana por arriba, el Dios es tremendo dentro del área, de cada vez cual, bueno, bueno, ahí está la casa el gol, Increíble. la casa el gol, la casa el gol, la This is Arscast Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arscast Extra as always with James from Gunner Blog. James, good morning to you. Good morning to you too, Andrew. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. I'm all right. Was uh, hoping for a little better from last night, but there you go. Such are the... Uh the what the machin the machinations the of football the vagaries yeah, exactly. of football i was hoping for that too especially because you know i'd had a nice uh arsenal themed couple of days yeah um, we had the arsenal vision live pod in which i was a, a guest with james benj and and actually because of that i was sort of acutely aware there were a lot of fans in the ground who maybe aren't there every week i met fans from you know, the States, from Sweden, from uh, Ireland, all over the place mm. who'd sort of come, uh, partly because this is a week with two home games, you know, and so you can you can get to a, a couple of games in the space of five days. And I was really wanted us to get the win for those guys, mm. but sadly, uh, it wasn't to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a quick word for our friends over at the Arsenal Vision Podcast. Congratulations to them on winning the uh, Best Podcast Award at the uh, Football Content Absolutely. Awards, I think it is. Well deserved. Keep up the great work, guys. And, uh, you know, it's great that there is this um, amazing amount, uh, and I've always said this, an amazing amount of great content for Arsenal fans. Regardless of your point of view, there's something out there for everybody. And uh, yeah, so well done to Elliot and Tim and Paul and Clive and Scott and all the crew over there. Uh, well deserved. And Andrew, remember how this feels. That's what we have to do. Pin this up on the dressing room wall. We're going to cut. <laughs> we, remember this feeling. Yeah. That's what I would say. In the oh, yeah, yeah. Says, the says the man who was on the Arsenal Vision Live podcast angling for a <laughs> January transfer window move. <laughs> I did see some people saying that, you know. Uh, oh, well, no, 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 no. A brief loan. Yeah, brief yeah. Loan. <laughs> like emergency goalkeeper kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. All right, so look. Let's talk Arsenal versus yep. Crystal Palace. The return of Patrick Vieira. Mikel Arteta versus Patrick Vieira. Arsenal versus Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace versus Arsenal. All of these things were in the uh, in the mixer before the game started. And, you know, coming off the back of an interlull, coming off the back of a reasonable period in the, in the last uh, four games. I know there was some disappointment over the Brighton game, but yeah. I think expectations were pretty high over this one, all things considered. And I do wonder, um, I'm not going to make any excuses for anything here, but I do wonder if, some of the disappointment that's going around is because we 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 did expect more from Arsenal. We did expect a better performance. We did expect the team to to play in a way which perhaps um, would give us some signs of encouragement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in the end, a, a two-two draw. I think maybe on balance fair given the overall game, but in the circumstances, yeah. it felt like we were fortunate to get that point. Well, it always is going to, I think, when you, mm. you know, get that 95th minute equaliser. And uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it was fair on balance. I think Crystal Palace were good, but I think how good they were, personally, I think it's been a bit overstated in the uh, sort of analysis of the game. I mean, I don't think they really created very much of their own back. I think we really, you know, the goals they scored, I think mm. we were very culpable on. Um, and I think without that, I'm not sure that they would have posed a huge attacking threat. Um, I, I think we were the architects of our own downfall in that regard. Mm. Uh, and and I, I think it probably was fair, but it was uh, quite underwhelming. And, and my sense on the evening was that, you know, people left the ground feeling pretty deflated, it, you know, rather than elated by a late equaliser. I think they were deflated by the performance and by the result. Yeah. And I, I, and I think... That, oh, go on, sorry. I was just going to say, I think that's sort of reasonable, really. I mean, you know, we we had had a decent run going to the international break. And I think especially we're aware that this is quite a big week. You know, two mm. home games, back-to-back, -back, games that Arsenal... 
I actually hesitate to say should win because I don't know anymore, but definitely could win. It's definitely mm. an opportunity to climb the table, give ourselves a more respectable league position, um, maintain our momentum. And, you know, uh, as Mikel Arteta said uh, after the game last night, we kind of put the handbrake on a bit. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you something. Though. I saw a question and I thought I'd opened it up here and I apologise yeah. to whoever it was on Twitter. Um, you know, we've we've talked in recent times about this, you know, maybe a slight difference between the, the in inverted commas, real life fan experience and some of the online discourse and a sort of gap between those two things. And whoever it was um, that asked the question again, I apologise, but I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, he suggested that maybe some of that frustration was evident in the stadium last night. It certainly felt a little bit like that to me, particularly in those final stages when we were looking for an equaliser and there were aspects to our play which definitely, definitely frustrated the crowd. You know, some of the, you know, the the wall passes going backwards a bit. I, I, I'm thinking of Gabriel Martinelli down the left-hand side, twisting and turning and turning and twisting, but nobody there to help him. And, and that seemed to, you know, his effort Effort was not uh, acknowledged by his teammates, things like that. So, you know, nobody's going to be in a good mood when you're losing in the 94th minute. Um, you know, a game, like you say, where we were in many ways the architects of our own uh, downfall yet again because of individual errors. But was some of that frustration, um, you know, the goodwill that fans have towards the team, the, the backing that they give towards the team, was it stretched a little thin last night because of what happened? I think it was not um, a negative atmosphere by any stretch of the imagination. It wasn't like, you know, when it's kind of the last days of a manager mm. and you feel like they're out to get him and, you know... It, I didn't sense any of that, have to be honest. I think that people were really behind the team and people were trying to rally and, you know, songs were going up even as kind of nerves and frustration set in. Mm. It wasn't the buoyant atmosphere that we've seen at some of the other home games this season. Um, you know, it has been quite uh, special, I think, experiencing that kind of return to the Emirates Stadium and full houses but I think maybe some of the novelty um, is slightly, slightly mm. wearing off. That was my sense last night. It wasn't overtly um, negative or anything mm. like it. It just, you know, I think some of the, yeah, the belief was a little bit sapped by a difficult 90 minutes, I think. But but the other thing I would say is that obviously when the goal goes in, you know, the fans who were left in the stadium, and to be fair, a good deal of them had left by that point um, because it's a weeknight and people mm. want to get home and they've got to get up for work in the morning. The celebrations, um, particularly from the players, but from the fans as well, were pretty raucous. And one of the things I observed when I came back online after the game was kind of people saying like, you know, why are Arsenal celebrating an equaliser at home to Crystal Palace? It's embarrassing. Um and, I, and from Arsenal fans as well as neutral fans. And personally, I just have absolutely no time for that. I just think it's a ridiculous position to take. Like, you celebrate because you haven't lost the game and that's better than losing it. Yeah, it's, it's, there is a sort of tone police element to this, which, you know, yeah. it's not as if when we were at our best under Arsene Wenger, we didn't have games exactly like this where we would rescue something late on, where we'd be down. You celebrate the goals. I mean, I get it. You have to be able to separate the bigger picture from the moment of the game. You know, and it's this this idea, all these false equivalences come out, like they're celebrating a goal against Crystal Palace like it's the World Cup winner. And it's not. It's like literally the last kick of the game and they've got something from it. Why the fuck not celebrate? It doesn't mean you can't be critical or analytical of the performance, but fuck me, enjoy enjoy the moment, at least. You know, the whole point of it is scoring goals. We don't score enough goals as a, as a team, you know. So <laughs> We've got to celebrate the ones we get. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, I, I don't like that pick and choose thing, you know, when it comes to 
um, to celebrating goals or the idea that because there was an expectation that we should beat Crystal Palace, that we can't then celebrate a goal to to save a point. You know, I, I, I think it's perfectly possible to look at last night as subpar or not good enough and worrying. And I think it was all of those things from my perspective anyway. But I mean, I was delighted when we scored the last minute goal because I would rather score the goal than not. You know, of course, of course, yeah, and I think um, I don't know. Maybe that attitude comes from kind of people who that you sometimes you get this situation where some fans are sort of so uh, have made their mind up about a manager that they almost sort of wish for uh, defeats to accelerate their departure. I mm. wonder if that sentiment is part of that, but. I, you know, I was really troubled and concerned by the performance. Maybe more so than, maybe more so than any I can remember recently. Actually, it really um, bothered me. But when Lacazette scored that goal, I mean, I was, you know, I don't mind admitting jumping into the arms of strangers just of because, you know, we. That's I, football. I, I pe- yeah, and I pay a lot of money to be there. I was in my season ticket, and I want to enjoy the good moments when they come. And yeah. also, I do think. That, you know, there'll be a lot to discuss sort of analytically and perhaps critically on this podcast, but um, not losing and keeping an unbeaten run going, there is a value in that. Um, and I, I do think that, you know, we we do see a good kind of team spirit from this group of players. And I think that's a positive, but they need to begin... Mm performing as well alongside that. Do you think the disappointment about the performance overall was exacerbated by the fact that we actually started well? We started the game brightly. We played a lot in their half. We scored an early goal. And I think we, you know, when we think about Arsenal, one of the things that, that I go into every game hoping for is an early goal because it does tend to take a little little bit of the pressure off us. It changes the dynamic. You know, these games where we get to halftime, it's nil-nil. You're thinking, well, there's another fucking wasted half of football. Hopefully we can turn it around the second half. You get to an hour mark, you get to 70 minutes, you start getting antsy. You know, the fact that we did score an early goal and, a you know, a smart goal, I think. Pepe, uh, his combination with Tommy Asu was good. The shot was good. The save was very good from the goalkeeper. But Aubameyang, who looked really, really sharp, I thought, all night, really uh, determined. Mm-hmm. You know, someone who wanted to, to make a positive contribution, put it away from close range. I think it was, what, eight or nine minutes in. And you're thinking, OK, this is good. This is something to build on. This is, you know, slightly reminiscent of uh, the way the Spurs game went in that we scored early and then we were able to build on that and capitalize on that. I I think part of what was most disappointing about this performance was the fact that that after that, we just we just didn't. Definitely. I think I was the same as you. Very relieved to get an early goal. I mean, I'm sure we'll come on to the shape of the team, but I was actually encouraged by the starting lineup I thought that that was uh, a very bold team with a bit more attacking threat than what we can usually muster and I was pro that I have to be honest Um, I don't want to be revisionist about that I thought that was the right move Um, but we just didn't sustain it in any meaningful way and actually Mm. Arsenal I think this team tend to start pretty well like I think like when the whistle goes the first five or ten minutes of a game I think we're usually very intense and uh, quite effective. Even in games like Man City, where we got absolutely battered, in that first five minutes, we sort of posed a threat. And if you think back to Brighton, you know, Saka went down the line early on Mm. and had a shot. And I think Thomas Tuchel spoke about it. He said, Arsenal always start really well. They come at you really early on. And I think that's true. I think the... The, the issue is sustaining that and we didn't on the day at all. And and also maybe I talk about the crowd being slightly flatter for this one. I almost wonder if in some ways getting that goal, uh, it kind of allayed some of the tension and anxiety in the crowd and it kind of meant that it sort of, you know, pacified and, and a little bit. And, and we, the performance was a big factor in that too. I mean, Crystal Palace over the course of that half, really grew into the game and and really finished it on top. Mm, I mean, they did. They did finish the second half on top, and I think that was their best spell of the game, to be honest. That sort mm. of half The first hour. half. Yeah, 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 the first half. Like, I think the second half was not much to write home about, but it was 
pretty even. I think, you know, the, the idea that Palace were really good, I don't think stands up to a great deal of, uh, of scrutiny. I think we were poor and they were okay and we made mistakes which gave them the goals. But I don't think it was a case that we were being played off the park by Crystal Palace or anything like that. And when you look at the stats in terms of possession, in terms of the number of passes, et cetera, et cetera, you know, I, I still think we had more of the ball overall, um, even if at times it didn't really feel like it. I, I can't find the exact stats here, but I, I'm pretty sure we were... Um, we were uh, so four seven uh, four seventy four passes to four hundred and two accurate passes five hundred and forty four total passes to four hundred and seventy five total passes, uh, you know so. Fifty-four percent possession we had on the night. Yeah, you know, so it wasn't a case that we were being outplayed by Crystal Palace or anything like that. I just don't think there was enough about us. And what was really noticeable to me was in that period when. After we had the goal, I think there was a chance for Smith Rowe um, when he should have yeah. probably played Pepe in, which is where I think I'd like to see maybe some of his decision making improve. Uh, I'm not being hugely critical here because he is still a young player, but when you're playing in that position, I, I, I do think you need to see those passes. Um, is that the one where he takes a, a shot. low shot? Yeah, from, straight at the keeper, yeah. And he had yeah, Pepe okay. outside him to the right who was looking for it and was a bit frustrated by it. But after that, when Palace started to get on top, when they had more possession, what worries me about this Arsenal team is the how passive we are. Mm. They don't engage, really. No, they, we really don't. Like, there were moments where Aubameyang would break into a sprint and he'd do the arm-waving thing, which reminded me a little bit of Alexis Sanchez. And sometimes Smith Rowe would go a bit, and sometimes Odegaard would go a bit, but there wasn't anything concerted in the way that we press. What we do when we get into situations like this in games is we sit off, and I, I, I assume this is part of the instruction, is to sit off and look to counter when the opposition mm. have that possession. But what we don't do is anything near enough to try and win the ball back in positions where a counter-attack could really hurt the opposition. So we let mm. them come to the edge of our box. We look for headers. We look to win that second ball sometimes. We look to somebody to to nick the ball when a ball is played into feet at the edge of the box and, and take it away from there. But what we don't do is try and win tackles in midfield. We don't try and press high up. We don't try and get the ball back in positions where the opposition have committed men forwards. You know what I mean? Mm. So by the time we get the ball and by the time we start to move it forward, they're back and they're organized and they're set up well. And that that passivity is, I think, a big, big problem. And I think it could be part of why we we are just a little bit toothless as well, because when we have the ball, we don't get it in a in situations where we can just make the most of the opposition. They're not turning around and running back towards their own goal. They're set up again. You know, they've got men behind the ball and I don't quite really, I just don't understand that lack of, for want of a better word, aggression. No, and what's weird about this game is that Abemiang was showing that. Um, so you sort of look at that and you scratch your head and you think, well, who's following the manager's instructions here? The instruction mm. can't be, Abemiang, can you hair after the the ball and mm. wave your arms and ask people to follow you like is the plan to press or is it not to press and if it if it is we're not doing it in a sort of concerted fashion um mm. i mean we'll get on to their goals but like something that's really interesting is when thomas part is dispossessed on the first crystal palace goal there are four crystal palace players all within about i don't know 10 yards of him mm. something like that and you don't see that really with this arsenal team I don't know if it's an adherence to shape or an adherence to you know players being in their zones, but very rarely do you see them go as a pack, you mm. know, after a player. Um, we just don't do that. We don't risk that. We don't take that risk. And I think that it's, um, you know, you think about risk when you have the ball. Are you prepared to take the risk? But are you prepared to take a risk when you don't have the ball? Are you prepared to step out, mm. push forward, engage, close people down? And, and you know, I think it was true in the final th in, in their own third. I think it was true in the midfield as well. I mean, you know, we played the three ostensibly in midfield mm. with Odegaard and Smith Rowe and Party. Emil Smith Rowe and Martin Odegaard didn't make a tackle in the game. 
you know, mm. the, the stats show, which I think tells you a bit about our, our trouble to sort of recover the ball from Palace. Um, but it is odd, yes. I think that we think of this team and we look at its uh, attacking deficiencies and we go, oh, sort of, I wish we were more front-footed with the ball. But I think we, we also need to talk about being front-footed without the ball. Yeah. And uh, I think that for me as well, like you, that was one of the things that really frustrated me in this game. Yeah, we're not a good off the ball team. Um, and we might as well talk about the goals now while we're on that yeah. subject. Um, I mean, Thomas Partey for that first one, I don't know if he's unaware. Maybe you could say the pass from Tommy Asu puts him in a little bit of trouble, but he did have a first time pass back. It's not an amazing back. pass. No, yeah. it's not. But he did have a first time pass back. I don't know if he was aware or if somebody didn't shout to him that the I think it was Ayu who was coming in behind him. Um, Benteke broke very kindly for Benteke, but from there I think he stepped inside Gabriel too easily, and yeah. you know from there it's a, it's I'm not going to say a routine finish, but. The sort of finish that an experienced striker at this level is going to make, you know. What do you want to see from Gabriel? They just not get caught. Uh, he's a bit square, isn't he? Square. And, yeah, he's yeah. a bit square. His body shape isn't quite right, so uh, it's easy for Benteke to just knock the ball and, and step inside. So um, the party thing. I mean, he he attempts something quite. Difficult. He set, he sort of attempts to sort of turn on his outside, essentially. Away He's trying from to man. do that thing, isn't he? Where we've seen him do it before, where he takes it yeah. and then flicks it with the outside of his right foot beyond the player, and then that gives him space to you know to turn into. And we did have a lot of space to go into if he'd been able to do that, but um, yeah, he got that wrong. Yeah, and I guess you know sometimes that's going to happen if you if you ask a player to do that. I mean, um, but it was. Very costly. Mm. It was very, very costly. And and it, it like I say, it was a gift of a goal. I chatted to someone at half time and we were saying, you know, Palace looked decent and they finished the half the better. But we were both saying, like, I don't know if they're gonna score. Like they, they weren't a huge attacking threat without Zaha, you know, Eze still out as well. I wasn't too worried about them. It was only gonna really come from our mistakes and and that's what we did. And it, yeah, it, it incredibly Frustrating because we were winning the game. It was early in the half. We'd made a change as well, mm. which ostensibly would have given us a bit more security in the middle of the pitch. And then we just absolutely let them back into it. Yeah. Um, re- yeah, really, really disappointing. I mean, their only shot on target in that period towards the end of the first half was the one, I think, late on. Right at the end. Right at the end yeah. when Ramsdale made a very, very good save from, I think it was from Conor Gallagher. Um so, yeah, I mean, their dominance in terms of possession didn't really translate to chances. The second goal, <sighs> Arsenal have a corner, and we should have kept the possession high up. I saw people talking about it maybe being a foul on, on Lokonga, but I'm not sure. I think it's just good pressure from uh, the Palace midfield. Is it Gallagher again who takes it? And Yeah, and um, he was absolutely brilliant, I have to say. Yeah. Like, he was the best player on the pitch, I thought. Yeah. Again, though, from there, there's work to do where I think our defending didn't really stand up to a great deal of scrutiny, to be honest. I I think if we were sharper, there's probably a foul to be made on the man before he... I was screaming from the north back. Yeah, before before it's uh, played out to Edward, I think there's a foul to be made there, but we're not sharp enough. Ben White doesn't really do enough, um, you know, to to close him down. He backs off, he backs off. He basically invites him to shoot, which he does. And it looks, I think it looks worse for Ramsdale than it actually is because it's quite close in the end by Mm. the time he takes a shot. He's inside the box and it's a really good hit just off the underside of the bar. So... I think the issue yeah. really is the 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 loss of possession and the defensive decisions that we made or didn't make, which allowed the shot to come in from that that position. Yeah, I, I was watching it back on Sky this morning, and there was quite the co-commentator sort of said, you know, Ramsdale wants to do better there. I was a bit surprised by that because where I'm sat, actually, I was kind of right behind Edward, and. Uh, from my view, it was like it flashed and it was in. You yeah. know, I, I think the visibility on that shot would have been pretty poor. And Jamie Carragher was very good um, 
Or it's Gary Neville actually talking about this post match, and mm. he was saying, you know, Peter Schmeichel used to say to me, um, what I want for my centre half in that position is to make the striker. Um, make a clear decision on which foot they're going to go with. So mm. with Edouard, for example, you want to push him onto his left there. And actually, he said, Schmeichel used to say to him, the important thing as well is once you've made that, I also want a sight of the ball. Like the chance of you actually tackling him successfully in that area are quite slim. So make a decision, push him on his weak foot. And then at least I get, a, if it's a clear view of it, I've mm. got a pretty good chance of saving it. And in a weird way, White, he kind of backs off. He sort of does neither. Like he's obstructing the view and he lets him take it on his right yeah. foot. I actually thought Ben White had a pretty decent game, but that was an, a bad piece of defending. Yes, it was. It was. It was not great. Uh, so, you know, both centre halves, I think, could do better um, for the goals that, that we conceded. Yeah. And maybe, and maybe Ramsdale will look at that, by the way, and say... Mm. Near post, I wouldn't want to be beaten there. Maybe my position's not right. Mm. But I do think there was stuff in the build up, build up to it that, that we could have done better. Yeah, and look, I, I think we have to say as well that the um, the second goal, the corner from the second goal came from a pretty decent Arsenal chance after Lacazette had come on. And he really did have a positive impact on this game in terms of the combinations that he started to make with Aubameyang. He had that chance on goal. He he sort of tried to G up the crowd a little mm-hmm. bit as well, mm-hmm. which I think is fine, you know, in that, in that circumstance. The reality is, you know, the crowd are responding to the performance that they're seeing on the pitch, you mm-hmm. know, and that performance was as we said, passive, it wasn't good enough. We, we, uh, you know, um, let in an equalizer that we shouldn't have. So if the crowd are nervous and they're nervous about this particular Arsenal team, I don't blame them at all for being a little bit like anxious or a little bit quiet about what's going on. Um, but I think Lacazette came on, did have a positive impact, uh, you know, changed the energy a little bit. Um, and then, of course, we're 2-1 down. <laughs> so yeah, you're looking yeah. then for um, for something to get you back into the game. We were a bit, what's the word I'm going to use? A, a little bit toothless, but I also think that you've got to get, uh, give some credit to Crystal Palace for the way that they stayed organized. In those mm. final stages, you know, one of the things that was really noticeable to me was that left-hand side. They packed it. They would not let any space for Kieran Tierney to get into. When Martinelli came on, there was no space for him whatsoever. They closed those spaces very, very well. Um, as we try to, you know, horseshoe it and and work the ball from left to right to create a little bit of space. I think Palace were were organised. Where I think they may have some regret is the substitution that they made when they brought on, um, was it Edward who went off and it was Tompkins who came on and it felt very, I remember thinking at the time I was going, that is a substitution straight out of the Arsene Wenger textbook there from Patrick Vieira. That kind of, we've got something, let's stick on another defender to hold on to it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't, you obviously have to look at that as one of the causes. I think it gave us just a little bit of momentum. I'm not saying we created a great deal, but what it did was allow us to play most of the final stages of the game in the Palace half. And from there, I'm not, you know, the pressure grew and tyranny hit the bar, and then inevitably um, something happened. We got the corner, and, and Lacazette, um, if there was a touch of good fortune to it, he was in the right place at the right time to get the equalizer. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, I thought when Tierney hit the bar, that mm. was basically me done. I was yeah, like, yeah, that yeah. was the chance, that was the moment. And we were, you know, inches away. And <clears throat> would have been great for Kieran Tierney because he's not been in the best run of form. No. So uh, a real shame. But. Yeah, Lacazette got the goal and actually a, a, a smart piece of movement from Ben White in the lead up to it. He doesn't go in and challenge on the edge of the six yard box. He drops off and very nearly scores himself. A bit of striker's instinct from him there. And then Lacazette's in the right place at the right time mm. to tuck it away. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, like I say, I think there is some value in, in rescuing a, a point from that situation, even if my primary feeling is is one of frustration. I, I think the point you make about them blocking off the left flank is really interesting and 
Kieran Tierney's most uh, common pass in the game by some distance was to Gabriel. And it felt like that. It felt like he had to come back inside a lot. Mm. There was a lot of that kind of horseshoe play. But I suppose where I'm sort of feeling a bit frustrated today is kind of like if I was Patrick Vieira or if I was an opposition coach, like I know what Arsenal are going to do. Like I know Kieran Tierney's going to push on really high and they're going to try and play him in on that left flank. And I know that, you know, Mm. when Sambi comes on, he's going to drop left. And I just feel like there was a sort of element of predictability about what what we did. Um, And Palace were absolutely ready for it. And it enabled them to be pretty comfortable for quite long periods of that game yeah look I think that's something you could if, if you're a, if you're an opposition coach and you're getting ready to play Arsenal what are the things that you want to be aware of it's Tierney yeah. down the left hand side even though that hasn't really been a huge feature of what we do so far this season whether that's to do with the opposition setting up that way to deny him the space or a slight tweak in the way that we've played beyond that stay organized against Arsenal and there isn't a great deal of craft. There isn't a huge amount of guile. Um, you know, we, we, we struggle to make chances at the best of times, um, particularly against teams which, um, which are organized and which do have some defensive discipline and, and everything else. So from that perspective, the fact that we were able to, to force that late equalizer, you know, is a positive. It does have some value. It is a point on the board, but these are the games, I think, where you're looking to see, are there signs of progress? Are there signs that we can start playing the kind of football we expect from Arsenal? You know, there is a, a level of expectation. There are standards. Mikel Arteta talks about it himself, that we're not reaching. We're not reaching. And, we, you know, it's reasonable to have some concerns or some doubts at this point as to whether or not we're going to be able to play that kind of football under Mikel Arteta. I know we have a young side. I know it's growing. I know all of those things, but I'm just not necessarily seeing the the, the building blocks or the you know the the signs in terms of how we want to play that make me convinced that it is going to happen or it is it is going to click. Like you know, if someone says to you, "What is Arsenal's identity?" It's very difficult to answer that question, isn't it? Definitely. And I think, you know, we might have optimistically hoped that we would have clicked against Spurs, but we've not really replicated what we showed against them in any of the two games since. I think, you know, if we played like we did against Brighton and then blown away Crystal Palace today or even just beaten them, you know, I think you'd be able to kind of compartmentalise that performance. But two games back to back mm. like that is a significant blow to the sort of credentials of this new Arsenal team that we're, we're calling it a new Arsenal team, I guess, since the transfer deadline, you know? And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it shows that we're not where we want to be and there's still quite some way to go. And but I, one of the things that, I mean, I found this game, everyone will react to different games differently, but this was a game that sowed some real seeds of doubt in in my mind um just because i was really troubled by what we did in the opposition half you know i spoke about us not being front footed defensively but the lack of kind of um what's the word it just felt very disjointed yeah uh, and i i never really felt that we were able to exert serious pressure that we created many chances and people will say well, we've we've done that before. We've seen that loads of times. But um, like I say, different games affect people differently. And for me, this was one where I really was like, oh, I don't really, I'm not sure. I'm, mm. I know where this is going. Yeah. You know? And yeah, it, it was it was troubling. And and I hope that that's a, a short lived uh, feeling. But yeah, it was it wasn't good. And and I and I, I just feel like we've. I said this. Uh, I was talking to Adrian Clark on Handbrake Off earlier and I, and I said the same thing, but I think w- w- for so much of Arteta's reign, we've talked about the first phase of play and what I mean by that is kind of what we do from the back. 
You know, yeah. we play out from the goalkeeper and the left back pushes on and, you know, we're going to line up with three at the back and Ben White's going to bring the ball out. And I feel like we've kind of reinvented that several times already in Arteta's reign in terms mm. of the shape, the personnel. And yet once we get over that halfway line, I'm not sure we're seeing much progress. I, I agree. I mean, there isn't the dynamism in midfield. And I, I, I think when you look at yesterday's game, two players in particular who we are expecting to be the de facto leaders of, of that area of the pitch for us, Thomas Partey and Martin Odegaard, both of whom for the second game in a row, I think were were not great. Odegaard in particular had a, a an off night, very similar to the one that he had against um, Brighton. Partey had yeah. some moments. There was a, a very good shot in fairness that just whistled beyond the, the post with the keeper scrambling. But, you know, his search for, for an Arsenal goal continues and we've already talked about his culpability in the in, in the first goal. You know, you need those guys to give you some measure of security, but you also need those guys to give you the the kind of um, the drive from that midfield third into the final third to make things mm. happen, to, to do things more quickly. Um, and that, I think, is part of the problem is that so much of what we do is at like 60% speed. You know, the decision-making isn't there. The, the passes aren't going. They're not crisp. They're not being played first time. There's, you know, everybody's taking a couple of touches before they make a pass. They're looking around to see what's going on. You know, the the, the little moments that excite us are when someone like Smith Rowe, for example, takes the ball and does a little turn with it, you know, because that gives you that, that forward momentum. So there's not enough of that. And I'm like you, um, you know, that, that last night was really worrying because of the the context of the game, the circumstances, you know, the fact that we were at home um, and that there there just wasn't enough about the way that we played. And there wasn't, even when things weren't going well, there wasn't enough to really change it. You know, we talk about Lacazette coming on and, you know, he, he did well when he came on. Uh but there wasn't maybe enough from the sidelines in terms of looking for the kind of intensity, looking for the players to make tackles, looking for the players to press, to to cause the opposition some discomfort in their own half. So, mm. yeah, look, we've got to see a lot better against Aston Villa on on Friday night because if it's more of the same, chances are it's going to be a similar result or worse. Oh, we'll get beat if we play like that against Aston Villa. Mm. I, I really think that. And... Um, you know, we need to be substantially better. It, it, you know, two things can be true at once. I think it can absolutely be true that if you've got a young team, a team who, frankly, aren't a top team, who are going to finish, you know, definitely comfortably outside the top four, I think, they're going to be games where they drop points, games where they underperform, um, and games where they, they don't deliver. And this mm. may just be one of those. That can be true. Yeah. And it can also be true that um, there are some real issues with the attacking part of this team. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, it, it, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, I no, just I mean like... Say, it, I think that's... Sorry, sorry. We, I'll, I'll, I'll be silent now. <laughs> no, 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 you you finish, you finish. No, no, I, was, I can't even remember what I was going to say now. I've got so enveloped in the back yeah. and forth. Uh, no, you go. No, it's your turn. No, yeah, I know exactly. what you mean. I, I just think it's one of those games that if you have worries or concerns or doubts about Mikel Arteta's ability to ever get this team clicking from an attacking perspective, this is one of those games which will really, really hammer that home. Definitely. And I think you're right to point out Odegaard and Partey had bad nights. And Odegaard... It's twice in two Premier League games he's basically been taken off mm. pretty early in a game. And for your star signing, that's not a good look. Um, I thought he was very good against Spurs, but he's not really maintained that. Partey, in the absence of Granit Xhaka, we need him to be really good. Mm. Really good. And so far, that hasn't happened. I, I I am sure all the listeners wish we didn't have to talk about Granit Xhaka again, but I do think that the loss of him uh, is an issue. And I think that Partey 
ironically, who was sort of the man we were hoping would kind of step up and, and absolutely fill that gap, maybe feeling his absence more than most. Mm, yeah. That could like be a right. midfielder needs a partner, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's I think that's fair. There's a lot resting on him when he's played as that kind of lone defensive midfielder. I know it's not quite that position, but you also need people to combine with. And I don't think, I mean, for the first part of the game, Odegaard played left of him more or less where you would expect Xhaka to play. He did. You know, did. but it wasn't, it just didn't quite feel right, you know? Um so, uh, yeah, look, I, I think we can expect better and we do need better for, from him. Um, and hopefully we can get some of that on, on Friday. Now, look, I've left this bit to last because um, I, I do think the game needed to be analysed or our performance needed to be analysed on its own merits mm-hmm. um, outside of the absolutely inexplicable decision by Mike Dean and VAR not to send off James MacArthur. So Mm. I don't want to talk about really how the game might have been different. Playing against 10 men obviously would have been an advantage for us. I'm kind of pissed off that we didn't play against 10 men because it would have made life easier for us and and maybe we would have won this game. And I, I bemoan that decision. But I also think that, you know, games throw up situations like this. So you have to talk about what the game was rather than what the game might have been. Um, it's it's an unbelievable decision from, from Mike Dean. Um, mm. There's a couple of things. One, MacArthur should have been booked a couple of minutes earlier for a, a foul on Smith Rowe that he then gave a, a yellow card to Bakayo Saka for the exact same foul. Cynical foul to stop yeah. a break. Slightly different in terms of the execution, but the same foul, the same reason it was made. MacArthur should have had his second yellow there, but really, that should have been a straight red card. He is absolutely nowhere near the ball, and he basically just fucking hockeys Saka out of it. It's I can't get my head around how that wasn't given as a red card. No, uh, especially when they get two bites of the cherry, you know? Yeah, they- yeah, yeah. I can understand, uh, I'm, listen, I'm no fan of Mike Dean, but maybe in this kind of melee, in the moment, I can see why you might not have the clearest idea. I mean, the guy came in from behind Saka, so his view was a little bit obscured. I can see why he might not send him off. I can't understand why they could review that, how they could review that, mm. and not produce a red card. Um, I thought that was absurd and uh, worrying you know as someone who's like all Arsenal fans protective of Bukayo Saka who Mm. is on the receiving end of some pretty heavy treatment sometimes because of the type of player he is I just thought um, it was a bit of a joke really that they didn't send him off what was the sense of that in the stadium at, at, at the time were you aware of how bad that foul was no, I wasn't. I wasn't. I mean, I, I think you texted me saying that should have been a red and I said I, I couldn't see it. And I was behind that goal that we mm. were attacking at that point. So there was a bit of a commotion around the ball at that point and I just didn't get a good view of it. I think um, if people had had a clearer view of it, you know, I think we probably would have seen more outcry. But I remember when Saka was booked, people were very pissed off because, you know, the feeling Mm. was Palace might have had one or two bookings before that point. Mm. Um, And Saka's foul, you know, relatively didn't feel like a big deal. There you go. I'll say this, and it might sound like a weird thing to say, but Bakayo Saka is lucky. He's genuinely Mm. lucky that he got that kick in the calf. It's going to be sore. It's probably going to keep him out for Friday. Um but he is absolutely lucky that that didn't connect with the side of his leg or the front of his leg because that was Shawcross on Ramsey levels of strength from MacArthur when he kicked him. Like he mm. uh, he kicked him in the softest part of his leg. And he's lucky because it could have been much, much worse in terms of an yeah, injury. Yeah. It really could have. Uh, that's why I cannot believe like the, we we talked about this maybe um, a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? This idea that that referees were being told to let it flow. Mm. So maybe 
and this isn't to make any excuses for Mike Dean, who's experienced enough of a referee to know what he's seen in that circumstance. But maybe that was part of the thinking that mm. if it was as bad, if he was like not quite sure it was as bad as he thought it was, VAR is there to make that decision, to look at that from the various angles. And there's one angle in particular where when you see where the ball is, when you see what MacArthur does and how he does it, it is essentially assault. It's an assault mm. on Saka. So I think we can be both pissed off with the way that we played last night and the fact that we didn't um, get the result that we were all expecting, but also annoyed that the officials absolutely let us down. Is that the right way of saying it? But they let Bakayo Saka down in a big way because that just means it's fucking open season again. If you let if you let tackles like that go without the without the correct punishment, you just you open the door for more of those. And some player is going to get badly injured this season because the referees and VAR have not been strict enough on what is genuinely violent and dangerous conduct. Mm, yeah, I, I well, I, I yeah couldn't disagree with any of that i think that's absolutely right it was it, it was outrageous really mm. that that wasn't a red card mm. okay well look will we leave it there for part one unless there's anything yes, else I on the game so yeah no no i think that's fine okay all right we will come back with your questions and more in part two right after this Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer questions that you sent to us on Twitter at Gunnarblog and at Arsblog and also on the Arsblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an Arsblog member on Patreon. I'm going to go first, James, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, the question comes from Ross Whitaker, who's at Ross Whitaker TV on Twitter. He says, if Arsenal are this bad in midfield now... What will it be like in January when Partey is gone? Is it a necessity to buy slash loan a linking midfielder in January? You could uh, change the word linking for, I don't know, good or world-class or semi-competent, whatever you like. But, you know, the midfield issue in January, given that Granit Xhaka is going to be out until 2022, it will probably take him some time to get back to full speed, which isn't that fast in the first place. Um, yeah, are you worried about that aspect of things? Am I worried about it? Uh, yes, I am. I'm very worried about the African Cup of Nations full stop, yeah. to be honest with you. Um, you know, we'll be without four players in all likelihood for a, a number of weeks. Um, that's a big concern. Central midfield, what would that leave us with? A just returned Granite Shaka, Sambi Lakonga, Maitland Ainsley Maitland Niles, um, and Martin Odegaard, if you consider him, you know, an option in that position. Um, I. <sighs> I don't I don't expect a signing. I'll put it like that. I don't expect it. Um would I like one? Sure, because I don't really believe that Ainsley Maitland Niles is long for the club. Uh I don't think he's got a long term future with Arsenal. So I think you know, I don't I think the same is probably true of Mohamed mm. El So sooner or later we need a signing there. Um I just sort of, I suppose I worry or wonder if they'll be able to get the play, the right player, the player they would actually want in that window, you know? Yeah. What do you think? I, well, I think it is a concern because when you consider Pepe will be going, Aubameyang will be going, Elneny going and Partey going, even if Elneny hasn't played a great deal, those uh, first three are, are pretty much um, part of the regular rotation. So it is... Yeah. going to be a big issue for us to deal with. I, I do feel like midfield is still an area where where we're weak or not as developed, if you like, as, as we would like to be. Um, Sambi Lukonga is a young player who's got plenty of time to to develop and to, to grow into his Arsenal career, but 
would you feel hugely confident if we got to January and, you know, you're playing him and Maitland Niles against, well, no. any team in the Premier League, really, you know? So I think it is a big issue. I, I yeah, the, the Shaka injury obviously plays a, a, a part in that for whatever people's opinions of him are. He is an experienced, relatively stable uh, player for the most part. Of course, he has those moments which none of us enjoy or, or want to endure, but he's generally a presence in there. And I think you would feel more confident with, you know, Lokonga and Shaq or, or Shaq and Malin Niles than just those two guys on their own. So I think it's a, a fairly big issue. Um, I thought it was quite interesting that they when they announced or they gave the latest team update, it was like, Jack is definitely out until the new year here. You know, he's working really hard, but like, it doesn't look like there's going to be any super quick return to action for him simply because of the nature of the injury. And then when you're out for three months, and I think what might be interesting about this as well is that Shaka isn't a player who's ever had to do this before. He's yeah. never had a long injury absence. So, who knows how he might react or how his body might react because I think he's one of those guys who's just like a, he's so durable he just kind of keeps going and keeps going and keeps going um, so I don't know what this kind of stop versus the rehab and, and the various issues that the injury might cause him um, might be so if they're not thinking about at least alone in January I'd be very, very surprised. Yeah, I mean, what will be interesting is they'll obviously, as we get closer to January, have some sense of what kind of shape Granite Shaka mm. is in, you know, and, and that will probably be a factor. But I, I also, this is uh, brave or stupid of me, but I don't discount Martin Odegaard as an option in that position, even though he was very poor last night. I still think that uh, he can do that job. Um, I, I wouldn't pair him with Shaka in January, for example, but I think that he can play as a deeper midfield player. Um, obviously, mm. he needs to do it better than he did yesterday, but I thought he was very good in that role against Burnley and I can envision him doing it again. So I wouldn't discount that as a, a, an option entirely. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think... I mean, what did you make of the rumours about uh, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain coming from Liverpool? <sighs> nonsense. Surely yeah, nonsense. I, I mean, I don't know definitively one way or the other, but I'd be extremely surprised if that was Yeah, that me was too. Correct. Me too. Um, you know, maybe the thing you take from the rumour is that Arsenal might be looking for someone, but I cannot mm -hmm. see a situation where we bring back Oxlade-Chamberlain. Um, you know a player who I don't think has really done a huge amount at Liverpool. I think he had some good games, but he had some good games for us as well, but mostly been a very, very inconsistent player. And I think that would continue, and I don't think it would really solve any of our problems. Um, let me just follow up on that one, though, with a question from the Discord from Paul Tomasu, who says, struggling to impact games and sub now twice around the hour mark, should we be concerned about Odegaard? Definitely. I think the last two performances have been uh, really not good and he, he's just not been able to impact games at all. Um, they've sort of seemed to bypass him. And I think that's a worry because he's one of our more technically able players and one of our more creative players. Mm. And he's just kind of ghosting through these matches. I am not in a place where I'm like, well, therefore he is bad and we shouldn't have bought him and he must immediately be <laughs> flogged. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a really gifted player in there, um, but we haven't seen it in the mm. last two matches. I think we did see it, to be honest, against Spurs. I thought he was really good that day. And I, yeah. thought, um, and I think he has shown... Uh, Flashes is almost a bit harsh. I think he's shown intermittently how good he can be at Arsenal. Um, but we need to find the role for him that maximises that and ensures he you know, gets on the ball and actually starts to affect the game. Do you think um, for the Villa game, I'm going to make the assumption that Saka is, is going to miss that? Um, yeah, and, I you would know, say so. 
at best, it's it's going to be heavy bruising, and maybe you don't risk him. Maybe you have him on the bench and what have you. But but it could be a very very badly bruised calf muscle um, that he's having to deal with. So, in that sense, does it precipitate a change of formation? I mean, do do you see Party and Lukonga starting with Smith Rowe on the left, Pepe right, and Odegaard behind the striker in the sort of more classic number ten position? Could be, could be. I mean, um, I think Lacazette's name will be in contention as well, given his impact. Uh, how you would accommodate him, I don't know. Of, of course, you've got Aubameyang, you could potentially put him out wide. I mm. think I think we will see, I mean, obviously we're going to see probably an enforced change with Saka, but I think we will see a change anyway. I think we will see something, you know, a bit more of a conventional double pivot at the base of the midfield. Um but yeah, I, I I I am a little bit worried about Odegaard. I still think that he's a, a very very good talent mm. who will come good. Just on the subject of Saka, Tanner Intro on the Discord says, "I honestly hope Saka is okay, but a small part of me thinks that an enforced six week absence might be exactly what he needs in order <laughs> no, to have no, a good no, second no, half of the season." No, no, no. What do you think? No, I don't think any enforced six week absence of one of our best players is good. For us, I mean, I get the point about him maybe needing a rest, but at the end of the day, we're just playing one game a week this season. We've got some midweek Carabao Cup action coming up, but, you know, you're looking to rotate the squad a little bit. We're playing one game a week, so I think he's got plenty of time to recover. Um, I don't worry about him in the sense that if we were playing, imagine this in the Champions League or something, when you're going to play Tuesday, Saturday, you know, Wednesday, Sunday, mm-hmm. you know, all of that, where you're where you're basically having to play him in every single game, then I would have real, real worries about it. I accept the fact that maybe he's suffering a little bit of a post-summer hangover is the wrong word, but feeling the impact of the efforts that he made during the summer, right? Um, yeah. But I don't see how any kind of six-week absence of Bakayo Saka would be good for him or good for us as a team. So please, no, I hope it's not anywhere near as serious as that. But it wouldn't surprise me if he was missing a couple of weeks, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's interesting. We are playing one game a week, but we're in the middle of this fortnight where uh, we do kind of play two games a week because the fixture list is a bit odd, especially with this Monday and Friday. Um, I think he'll miss Friday. I hope it's not more serious than that. I do think Mm. that uh, he is an important player for us. Although I have to be honest and say, I think there is a significant disparity in the quality of his performances on the left as opposed mm. to the right. That's the another time. thing that I meant to say to you in the in the first part of the the show that I did, uh, and I know he got injured right at the end of the first half, and maybe it was something that could have been implemented in the second half, but I was a little bit surprised that they didn't swap over a bit, Pepe yeah. and, and Saka. And we had a number of questions here about Pepe, and let me see if I can dig one out here now. Um FPL Manatee, who's at FPL Manatee, <laughs> who's okay. uh, the the number one Manatee when it comes to yeah. fantasy uh, football, I'm told, I'm guessing anyway. He says, do you think one reason Pepe so often struggles on the right is that he never has an overlapping fullback? Given opponents seem to have well and truly worked out our tyranny plan, is it time to get Tommy Asu further forward a bit off, a bit more often and to vary things? And there were a number of variations on that particular thing about Pepe not having an overlapping fullback, which can at times allow him to make combinations, but also get a little bit closer to the to the penalty box where, you know, we saw the impact that he had in the in the first goal. Yeah, I think the plan in the first half and in this system, the way we played it at Burnley and the way certainly we were doing the warm-up drills was that Emil Smith Rowe would kind of be the combination player for Pepe. Mm. So he would sometimes go inside Pepe, sometimes outside him and basically hang to the right slightly and and offer him a partner there. And I didn't mind that as an idea. I think Emil Smith-Rowe is brilliant at that. He's great at kind of interchanging positions and Mm. finding the space, finding the gaps. Once we got into the second half and um, Smith-Rowe... 
uh, sort of adopted a more conventional role on the left-hand side. We separated him from Pepe. And then I thought you saw Pepe looking pretty isolated. And actually, in the second half, I was looking at changes Arteta could make. And I was thinking, bring another right back on. Bring Maitland-Niles or even Cedric on. Someone who provides a bit more in the final third than mm. Tommy Asu. Because Palace, the question's right, we're absolutely on to what we were trying to do with Kieran Tierney. And not only that, they were on to Tommy Asu as well. They knew about his limitations. Uh, they knew he wasn't going to, you know, beat a man and swing in a brilliant cross because that's not the kind of fullback he is. Mm. And I take the point, yeah, we could release him more. Um, but to me, yesterday, it was crying out to make a change there just to bring a bit more balance and unpredictability to the attack in those final stages mm. and give us someone who would go on the outside. I wonder if that might have been an option had we not had to make a halftime change because of the injury to True. Saka, because we brought True. on Lacazette and we brought on Martinelli, you know, so you're not robbed of one substitution, but that option, if, you know, you're trying to get back into a game and you bring on a right back, not too many people are going to be big on that particular change. You know what I That's mean? That's fair. That's fair. But I do think it's something that mm. um, had we had, <laughs> had we had that extra substitution, I think it would have been helpful. Um mm. What did you make of Tommy Asu yesterday? I... I mean, I was. He won tackles, but he only yeah. won one out of five aerial duels, which is a bit strange because that's where he has been strong. Mm. I think he gets to the opposition final third, and that's kind of as far as it goes for him. Mm. You know what I mean? I, I, and I think maybe what we're seeing is that. He is basically a central defender playing at right back. I mean, he considers mm. himself a central defender. So your instincts in that final third, if you're a central defender, are not, you know, are not necessarily conducive to providing the end product that you need. Like if you're a center half and you're in the in the final third, you're waiting for the ball to come in from a corner or for a set piece, you know, to challenge for it. You're not necessarily there to try and make something happen or be creative or be part of the creative process. You're, you're, you're sort of up there to get on the end of stuff. So mm. I think he's had a difficult couple of games as well, um, the last two. I don't think he was uh, bad or anything like that, but I think there are some limitations to the attacking side of his play. Um so, yeah, and I think we we all knew that, right? Yeah, I mean, and and the club presumably knew that as well. But particularly they, they what they were buying. Yeah, particularly though when the Tierney outlet is is gone because of the yeah. way that Palace or or whatever opposition set up. If you're switching the play, you need something maybe a bit more or something different, as as you said. And I do think, unfortunately, that while Cedric and Maitland Niles can give you that little bit something different both are imperfect options in that position definitely you know? i'm not saying they're yeah yeah, yeah, yeah i know i like know. it it's just a, a bit of a contrast but yeah i i think um on the subject of pepe i think basically you've got to give him somebody to combine with and i don't think it has to be a fullback like it can be smith Rowe, like i was saying or mm. in the second half maybe it ought to have been martin odegaard yeah he just was a ghost in the game as i said you know just not he good did, he did day. spend a lot of time on the right hand side odegaard yeah. in that second half but um yeah he wasn't as as precise as he normally is um no. so whether there's something going on with him or he's carrying an injury or something like that i i don't know I, I, and I've seen a lot of frustration about Pepe's performance. And listen, we all know he's a frustrating player to watch. But I also look at the goal we scored in the first half and I think, well, it comes from him being a guy who is prepared to kind of take on those individual moments, mm. you know, cut inside and have a shot and make something happen. And he he does offer that. I was pleased to see him in the starting eleven because of that. Yeah. That element of of chaos, if you like, um, and that chaos is it sounds a bit like um, unfair, but but an unpredictability or or a desire at least to try and do something with the ball other than just lay it backwards. Yeah, and just on Tommy Asu, by the way, you spoke about him winning less aerial duels. I mean, 
we should point out Palace played basically with three centre forwards, right? They played Benteke, uh, they played Edouard, and they played Jordan Ayo, Ayu, who, yeah. who can all play up top, really. And, you know, there was very, I mean, we talk about Arsenal not being front footed. That is quite front footed. These were guys who were going to physically challenge our players in their own half, and uh, it paid dividends. For mm. Okay, here's a couple of questions. Um, yep. AFC Met says, have, we, have you ever seen an Arsenal team as bad in possession as this one? And uh, Arsenal Vision Podcast, never heard of them, says, why can't we maintain possession in the attacking third or really at all? Even the games you tend to win tend to be uh, back and forth with few periods of sustained pressure, if any. And I think this is something that... Um, not that it grinds my gears, but but lack of control or security on the ball, I think, is a really. Um, I'm I'm surprised by it, given the kind of player Mikel Arteta was, and given the kind of manager uh, and managers he's worked with, this this security and possession that we 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 just don't have is surprising to me. Yeah, yeah, I had a question from Cactus Cash that says, why are we... Oh, sorry, that's about something completely different. Sorry, Cactus. <laughs> You'll have <laughs> to said, come back to so that poor? one. He said, why are we still so poor without the ball? And I thought it said with. Okay. Uh, both fair. Um, I think that is alarming. I mean, I, you know, I sort of run through this in my mind and I'm like, do we overrate these players? Uh, but I, I don't think that is it. I do believe that Martin Odegaard, Thomas Partey, Emil Smith Rowe, you know, Ben White, Gabriel, Kieran Tierney, these players should be capable of looking after the ball. Um, it is worrying for me that we don't have sustained spells of pressure. I think sometimes people expect us to dominate from the first minute to the last, and that just doesn't happen. Like, even look at the Spurs game. That's a burst of goals in the space of half an hour or something like that. Mm. And then in the second half, you can sit off, right? But we don't exert periods of pressure. I'm talking about 20 minutes. Like, that's all it needs to be. 20 minutes in a game where you create a number of chances. You can win a game in that time. Mm. Some of the best Arsenal teams did win a game in that time. Um, and we don't seem to muster that. And... Uh, I don't have a great answer, sorry, for, for like why that is. I'm, I'm genuinely a bit confused. Um, I mean, something I thought, which is like a very sort of generic observation yesterday, was I just felt that like we lacked uh, presence. I used the word presence in my post-match video in the opposition half. And that's not, people will say, well, are you saying we need to get rid of Aubameyang and put Dominic Calvert-Lewin in there? It's not quite as simple as that, but I just feel like we don't hold the ball. And I, I'm not just talking about the centre forward. I'm talking about the attacking midfield players being able to receive the ball under pressure and keep it. Mm. I just feel like we're not doing that very well at the present time. Um, and not only are we not doing that, we're not winning second balls either. So we end up just sort of giving the ball back basically all too often. Mm. Um, it, it, it is a worry. I mean, the thought I keep having at the moment, which I sort of don't really, I hope I hope it's not too hard. I don't think it is. But if I, if somebody told you that this manager, that his previous job at Man City if somebody said, oh, it turns out he was actually Pep Guardiola's defensive coach, I think everyone would be like, oh, yeah, I see that. Like, I, I, that's not the case. But mm. I'm just saying that if he feels like a manager who's pretty good at, like, organising a team and pretty good at sort of defence and coaching even the defenders, you know, their ball progression and things like that. But like I said in part one, I just feel like once we get beyond that... Mm. It's just not it's just not quite happening at the present time. Yeah. I don't think it's a personnel issue. I mean, I think you can always look at a team and think we could use better players here or there or what have you. But, you know, you look at a team like Brighton this season in the in the Premier League, who in most yeah. of their games absolutely dominate possession. And I'm not even talking about being the kind of, you know, a Wenger team that if you played a a, a side like Brighton or Crystal Palace or whatever in the past, you play most of the game in their half and you'd 
create chances and all of that. I'm not even talking about that kind of thing. I, I just, it's hard to, to, to quantify or to explain, but I never feel safe when we have the ball. Mm. Mm. I never feel like we as a team are confident in what we're trying to do with the ball. And maybe yeah. it's because what we're trying to do is so specific that when you're trying to do it outside the confines of the the perfect training ground environment, it becomes more difficult or your decision making is is not great. Um, but I don't feel secure when we're in possession, either I, in I, the, the, the yeah. final third, the middle third or the attacking third. I always feel like it can break down at any moment and, and quite often it does. I think a lot of it is about movement. I think that, as I said in part one, if you're an opposition coach, I think you pretty much know exactly where those 11 Arsenal players are going to be at any mm. phase in the game. Like, we can all track Kieran Tierney's movement in a game. We can all mm. track that Pepe's going to be out there on the right flank. We know pretty much that Granite Xhaka or whoever at Sambi Lukonga is going to drop in at left back. We, It's quite... Um, it's not a novel observation, but it's, yeah, and rigid. And I think, like, what's good movement? Movement, like, is what breaks patterns, what breaks systems. Think about the great players, Lionel Messi or even, you know, Dennis Burkamp, Thierry Henry. They picked up positions that were unusual, atypical, that dragged teams out of position. Mm. And I don't know if we do that enough. We don't. Well, sorry, I do know. You do know. <laughs> you just don't. told me. But but I, I, I think that's a massive part of it. And I, there were times, like, Gabrielle had a lot of the ball at centre-half yesterday. And have, go on. No, I was just going to say, have you noticed that in the absence of Shaka, he has become, like, the de facto possession guy? I yeah, think in nearly uh, all of our games so far, he's had the most possession and made the most passes. And I, and I think part of that as well is that... Um, the opposition don't want White to have it, you know, so they, they tend to block off his lanes a bit. But Gabriel, and I think he does all right. Mm. Like, I think he's pretty good. But there were points in this game where I saw him dribbling up from the edge of his own box to, you know, 30 or 40 yards, looking for a pass and not being able to find it. Because the way it looked to me, it just felt like Crystal Palace had sort of looked at, you know, the almost the sort of touch maps of the Arsenal players and been like, right, well, he'll be here, mm. he'll be there, he'll be there, and he'll be there. Mm. So we'll just mark them up. And we don't have, you know, we again, we talk about improvisation and creativity on the ball. What about improvisation and creativity off the ball in terms of our movement? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's a big thing. And, and I, I think passing conviction is part of it as well. You know, there were points in the second, there were points in the game where it honestly felt like the most progressive passer on the team was playing in goal. Yeah, there was one uh, pass in the first half in particular where I was like, oh, actually, that's very fucking tasty indeed. But like, that's not the pass that you, I'm not saying it's wrong for him to do it, but those are not the passes that you expect your goalkeeper to make. Those are things that your midfielders and, and defenders should be making. Yeah. And then they stand out because it's like that pass genuinely broke lines split yeah. the press and you know too often yesterday was it returned to that horseshoe stuff but I in, in defence of the players with the ball I do think that the the movement and, and, and Lacazette I mean it, movement is not you know you wouldn't say oh he's fleet of foot and he's a natural sprinter and all those things but the uh, when he came on the movement and particularly, I guess, kind of the interchange of movement that was happening between him and Aubameyang at least changed the pattern, yeah. you know, at least broke yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the system a little bit. And I thought that was positive. I mean, I had a question about uh, Lacazette. Uh, where was it? Dan Gribben said, this is an extremely basic observation. Well, welcome to the podcast, Dan. That's very much what we do. <laughs> uh, but Lacazette deserves serious praise for his efforts today, right? His attitude was spot on. He created chances. He had chances. He scored. We'd have lost without that cameo. Yeah, I think he, he had a very good um, a very good performance. I think it raises the question again of like, should he start against Aston Villa? And then it's like, well, what do we do with Aubameyang if that's the case? And, mm -hmm. you know... <sighs> 
the Aubameyang on the left thing has been done to death and I don't really want to see it, but Lacazette came on and made a very good case for himself. You know, in that period where he did lift the crowd, he lifted the team, he scored a goal, um, you know, he had one good shot saved. So, mm. you know, the, and I think there was an element of, um, you know, this is a guy who hasn't played a great deal, who wants to play more, who came on, who, I don't mean to say he just ran around a bit, but he certainly moved around the pitch and his combinations with Aubameyang, I thought the two of them together, actually, between yeah. each other, you know, I'm not saying one was better than the other, but the fact that they had each other to combine with, it made a difference. And just, yeah, going back to what you were talking about there, about the movement and the off the ball movement, I think that's what uh, made part of that last 10, 15 minutes so frustrating. You know, you could see that um, as we were beginning to, put a bit of pressure on, at least territorially, on Crystal Palace as they sat off after they made that change. There was frustration when an Arsenal player would receive the ball and then go backwards and start again, which I understand because we needed to get the ball forward and we needed to get a goal. But if there isn't somebody to pass to, if there isn't anybody making a run, if there isn't anybody between the lines, if there isn't anybody who can allow you to make a progressive pass... Your only other options are, A, you go back and you start again, you try and move the opposition around to, to create some space mm. for somebody to go into, or you just sling it in. You just put it in the mixer and you hope for the best. And there was an element of that to the goal that we scored, uh, and that's what it comes down to in the final minutes of the game. But, you know, the frustration wasn't simply because the players were passing backwards or, you know, there was a wall pass or whatever. It was because there was nothing else for them to do. Mm, mm. I, I agree with that. And actually, I also think it's the, it's the quality of the pass. You know, Kieran Tierney's taking a bit of flack, or that's maybe not unfair, he's not taking flack, but people are aware that he's not having the impact that he did last season. But watching the game yesterday, I was struck by... Uh, the 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 areas in which he received the ball and the fact that he often received the ball on the back foot, the ball wasn't often played mm. in front of him yeah, yeah, for him yeah. to arrive at speed. Agree. And he's agree, a, agree. a player who's all about arriving onto the ball, the momentum. We all saw those sprint stats, right, in the week about how fast he can travel. Um, and uh, I, I just think, again, to bring up Granit Xhaka, often lamented for just spinning it out to Tierney but it's a thing he does very well he, he plays it into his path and Tierney's not if he's not receiving it on the move he's in trouble he's got to do that thing where he sort of stops and then knocks mm. it and it it's hard for him so and, and that's actually an area where I think Sabi Lukonga uh, I think he's a really promising player but he can improve I think sometimes he plays these quite sort of lofted passes that yeah. take quite a long time to get where they need to go. And I think maybe in Belgium, you might get away with that, but you, it's the Premier League and you've got to move the ball quickly, 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 you know? Yeah, the quicker you move the ball, like even half a second can make an advantage, you know, and I don't yeah. think it's necessarily just true of passes to Kieran Tierney. I think it's an it's an issue for the team no. in general. It's It drives me crazy that, that professional footballers cannot you know, judge the two or three yards that they need to hit the ball into. I know there's an element of precision needed. You don't want to play it too far ahead of them. But the fact that players have to stop just um, halts any kind of momentum that you might be building. So that element yeah. of the way that we pass the ball uh, is in need of some big improvement. It is, yeah. It is. And, like, that's a difficult, you know... What is that? Is it tactics? Is it coaching? Mm. Is it uh, personality? It's a mix of all those things, I guess. But yeah, troubling. And on the subject of Lacazette, just coming back to the question, I find it very hard to say if he should play against Villa. I, I, it's a difficult one because of what it means for Aubameyang. I mean, they actually ended the game playing as a sort of pretty conventional front two. Uh, by that point, and, mm. and Arteta actually signalled that really clearly to Aubameyang, just gave him the two fingers, uh, the, the nice two fingers, not the bad two fingers. And <laughs> he went and played right next to Lacazette. I, personally, I thought even when Aubameyang went to the left, it was clear he was trying to get close to him. Mm. And it did seem to bring them both to life a bit. I mean, I, yeah, he's got something to think about there because... You know, Odegaard's played poorly the last two games. Lacazette's come on and done all right a couple of games. Mm. Saka might be out. 
it's a it's an interesting one. It, I'll be I'll be curious to see what he does because he's been very wedded to Aubameyang through the middle, and I I understand his reasons for that. Um, but you know, Lacazette is showing he's got something to offer. Maybe, maybe it is from the bench. I yeah, don't know. I you know if it, it feels like a lot of our problems, not a lot of them, but it feels like we could make some real progress if we could play a four five two. You know what I mean? Yeah, that would help actually. <laughs> I mean, the other thing about Lacazette is I am just thinking like. Do like do we just want? I know we've been down this path. I know we've been down this path. But do we just want another goal scorer on the pitch? Like he mm. is a goal scorer, um, and I don't think we can say with conviction that you know mm. Saka and Smith Rowe and Odegaard are goal scorers mm. uh, at this point in their career. Don't know. Yeah. It's tricky. It is a tricky one. Um, okay, here is one from. Uh, Booten Schlenks on the Discord who says, do you think we will ever see an independent body that oversees poor refereeing decisions in the Premier League? Many other sports have it where if there's a, a blunder, the referee slash umpire gets demoted to the lower leagues or they sit out for a number of weeks. Why does the Premier League not have this when they claim to be the best league in the world? Also, fuck Mike Dean. <laughs> yeah, they're very protective of their referees, I think. And actually, I have a measure of sympathy with that. I do think it's a, a difficult job and the game is played at such a ferocious speed now that it's difficult. But that's why you have video assistant referees, I guess. And it feels almost like we now need a, we need VAR for VAR, right? We need somebody in another room <laughs> for, for another thousand miles away. Who will police the police? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why, was it MacArthur stayed on the pitch yesterday? It's really a head scratcher. I understand the new edict about let it flow, but once you've already gone to VAR, then it's not flowing. Mm. So make the right decision. Yeah, when the player is lying down really badly hurt because some guys just there was plenty of time booted his fucking leg I, I i think there should be some kind of transparency or accountability to pgmol who are the um premier league match officials limited um i don't think that there is enough transparency or accountability to referees they sort of decide what goes themselves and while it might open up another layer of bureaucracy or, or anything else, I just find it remarkable that the same people have been in charge of the referees for so long. And I don't want to like make this as an excuse for us or anything like that, but I think the standard of officiating um, would be helped mm. if there were systems in place which, like it's not to say a referee can make a mistake. Of course he can. He's a human being. If the re if the mistake is compounded by VAR making a mistake when it definitely shouldn't, I mean that's part of what VAR is for. So if the two of them make a mistake, surely somebody to hold that to account and say, look, in this situation, if it happens again where a player literally just kicks the leg off another player, you know what you should do? You should give him a red card, mm -hmm. or you're out of here, pal. Maybe that focuses the mind but I think there is an element of the same people have been in charge for so long that it's just it's just a consequence of of these same old faces who don't really have to answer to anyone and I always hate the idea that because a referee who's in the Premier League does a bad job he's then foisted upon Doncaster Rovers or something as if as if they're not good enough to deserve a good referee themselves so mm. I don't know about the demotion thing but yeah, what's the consequence of a referee having a terrible game? Apart from, like, a bit of online outrage. Well, and some bruising on Bukai Saka. Um, mm. Let's go to the Discord. Important question from John Foster. Question for James. Does Clive smell as good as I imagine he does? Yes. Um, from George TC. Goodly morning, fellas. How do we best utilise Partey in the absence of Shaka? His performance has been well under par in the last two games. And this seems to be a trend when he's given full responsibility to shield the defence and link play with the attackers. Would putting Mohamed Elneny beside him be a temporary solution that allows him to simplify his game? Or make Lenars perhaps think Sambi will be good, but his defensive attributes are very much a work in progress. 
Look, I think, um, you know, it, it's very difficult to make the case that putting Mohamed El Neni in the team is going to make us what we want to be. But I can kind of see some of the logic in terms of how he plays and, and the way that he uses the ball. I'm not saying that's what I want, but I do understand where the question is coming from. Mm. I think the party partner is something we've spoken about before. I know I've written about it. It's... It's an important cog in whatever this machine is going to be. It was going to be Granite Xhaka. Let's face it. It was never the plan for Thomas Partey to be the guy because as soon as we decided we were hanging on to Granite Xhaka, Granite Xhaka was going to start every game alongside Thomas Partey. So I think the obvious answer is we've got to get someone uh, someone else in there alongside him. The question is who? Personally, I think given that we spent some uh, money on him, that he's a young player, that he does have time to develop. I would like to see it be Sambi Lokonga, give him the games, get him the playing time under his belt. Maybe he'll have some ups and downs along the way. But if you're genuinely looking to develop the young players that you've brought in, you don't pick Mohamed El Neni. So for me, let's go with uh, Sambi and uh, and see how that goes. And then if in four, five, six games you've got to make another decision, then at least you've given that a chance. Yeah, I completely understand where the question comes from in terms of giving the team a bit of a platform and stability. And I'm almost tempted to say, yeah, give it a go. But I but I, I just about come down on the side of, I think most things Mohamed Elneny can do, Sambi has the potential to do. And I just think we've, mm. you know, we've taken these steps towards the future. You know, we have... Um, you know, moved away from quite a lot of things and, and sort of clearly are trying to build an identity going forward. And I, and I think we have to keep moving in that direction. And, and I sort of think that we have to keep doing that even if it's going to cost us at times, you know, like it did yesterday. Mm. I mean, Sambi makes a mistake in the in the build-up to the second goal. Um, that, I think, is just something that we have to accept, you know? And, mm. and, and I sort of mean that of of him and of all the young players, you know, I, I, Bakayo Saka and Emil Smith-Rowe, you know, if they have a bad game, I won't be calling them for them to be dropped for the next one because they're young players and inconsistency is part of that. Um, mm. I think that, you know, we've kind of made our bed. We've well, made our decision there. Well, isn't that it? Like if, if um, I'm not going to say excuse, but if one of the reasons why... Edu, etc., has been calling for. Well, he, has, he didn't specifically say patience. He sort of mm. intimated at it and said, "Look, this is a young team. It's going to take time to come together." If that is part of your thinking, if that is mm. part of why you want fans maybe to to give them a little leeway, you've got to pick those players. You can't pick the experienced guy who's been here for five, six years and and has never quite reached the level. You don't get that yeah. consideration if you do that. You know what I mean? No, I know. And that's part, That's I have to be honest, like that's where I'm in two minds on Lacazette to an extent, you know, because mm. um, on the one hand, he's an Arsenal player. We're paying him a lot of money and he seems to be in good shape. Let's use him. But on the other, I'm like, well, <sighs> kind of belongs to the past in some respects in terms of the trajectory of this team mm. it's clear he's not going to be here beyond the summer um, and I think you could probably say the same for Mohamed El Neni mm. I kind of think yeah yeah uh, build for and, the future you know, I, yeah and, I, and I've sort of banged the drum and said look let's be bold let's get these young guys in let's start building something when it doesn't work you can't chuck that out no. you know um, you have to give it a chance it. You can't throw the babies out, out with the bathwater. Yeah, especially when you need the babies in the bath. Exactly. In yeah. the water. Mohamed El Neni, just let him have a shower somewhere else. Exactly. Don't, he doesn't need to get in our bath yeah. right now. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, a couple of quick ones before we go. Um, bum, bum, bum. Emil Smith, row your boat, says, on a non-Arsenal related note, after seeing the Sky Sports consent manufacturing machine go into overdrive for Newcastle's owners on Sunday. How badly do you want Newcastle to be relegated? I'm at 10 out of 10 personally. 
It would be fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. It it'd would be and, and fucking it would, hilarious. And it would buy Arsenal some time as well, <laughs> which would be good. Um you know, talking about having a young team and how how quickly can they get any good. Mm. Um because also I think getting out of the championship is an absolute ball ache. Like it's a really hard league, even with massive resources. So mm. Yeah, I would uh, feel a bit sorry for Joe Willock, but other than that, be absolutely over the moon. Yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, final one. Um, this one comes from Laguna Beach, or is it LA Gunner Beach? I don't know. Uh, anyway, they say, is it time to ditch the green turf around the Emirates perimeter, the perimeter of the pitch? More and more clubs are using the primary kick color instead, and it seems like a much better aesthetic I'll, sh- I'll send you the tweet in the chat here and you can have a look and see uh, mm. what you think. Um, and also um, from AS37 Gunnar on the Discord, who says, bit of a different one, can we talk about the TLC required at the Emirates? Last night, one of the big screens wasn't working. The outside of the stadium, including the club badge, requires a new lick of paint. The North Bank lower behind the goal has a section of fans that get completely drenched every 10 minutes or so because of a leak somewhere. I just think it reflects pretty poorly on the club, who used to be known for doing the little things right. Uh, he also says, I noticed the new look dressing room, which looks sexy as fuck. Could that be the start? And those of uh, those of you who are into your t- Tunnel areas will also be aware of the fact that Arsenal have improved the tunnel area, uh, our famed tunnel area. Ivan Gazidis must be just licking his lips at the prospect of coming back to Arsenal to experience mm. the peace and tranquility and joy of of the perhaps most amazing tunnel area in football. Uh, yeah, I'd never thought about that, about the green turf. And it's, like, it's not real turf, is it? It's, no, um, it's astro turf. It's like astro turf, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, it's never bothered me that it's green. What do you think of the the red look that uh, is being shown off by Southampton in this picture? That we're yeah, and there's a blue one for Leicester as well. Um, I like it. I have to say, I do like it. Um, I, I don't think it's our biggest issue at this moment in time, but it is really? a nice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Funny that I know, but I, I do like I do like the look of it. You know, the one at Southampton, it does look good, and it gives this nice separation between you know the playing area and the the technical area and, and everything else i mean it's it's purely purely an aesthetic thing but um you know it, it looks nice i think yeah why not i mean i i take the point more generally about could the emirates do with a sort of lick of pain and mm. i sort of think i sort of think it could actually i mean the technology in building stadiums moves so fast that if you look at um a stadium built very recently and the Emirates, you can already see a slight disparity there. I mean, mm. it's a fantastic facility uh, and I'm I'm not knocking the job that was done with it, but I think particularly on the sort of external aspects, you know, um, all the, the, I, I think it could do with, yeah, a, a figurative lick of paint. A bit of reinvention wouldn't be a bad thing. Mm. Uh, it's good to see they're making changes to the dressing room and the tunnel, and I imagine you know other areas uh, that we don't get to see might have already had a bit of a makeover. But yeah, why not? It's been there uh, what fifteen years now, so yeah, I think it should be an ongoing process. I, I think mean, I it is. When, yeah, I think Do it you? is. I, they're, they're certainly aware of it because I know Andrew Allen um, emailed the club about it and got a reply from from Vinay, who said they're aware of it and there are things that they're working on. And because of the pandemic, you know, certain things have happened, but they are certainly conscious of the fact that there are elements of the stadium that, that need some some touching up and, and everything else. So hopefully they, they get around to doing that, you know. Pride in your home, et cetera, et cetera, is, you know, it's a good thing to have. And, um, you know, we deserve as fans, um, you know, the best stadium that they can give us so in the absence Absolutely. of like trophies and champions league and all that they could mm. get the paint out so okay all right well look we we'll leave it there for today it is going to be a, a busy week because obviously we play villa on friday so all the usual stuff between now and then preview podcast on patreon regular arse cast on friday um for now though thanks as ever for listening and we will catch you on the next one bye bye bye